Historical figure? I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person, like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue, he was a man. I think he was a marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't, I don't think he's the son of God. I don't, don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like, I'm not gonna say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was, you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. Was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. Who is Jesus? That's a, that's a foundational question to our faith, for sure. It's probably the first question, really, that we have to answer. And I would say it's probably the most important question that everybody is going to have to consider at some point in their life. Who is Jesus? There's certainly a lot of ideas out there, right? I mean, a lot of opinions, a lot of perspectives, different reasons. So, uh, who do you say Jesus is? Well, in this series, Ancient Words, Enduring Faith, these words of the Apostles' Creed, we get to the second paragraph, we tell it the second article, uh, it talks about Jesus Christ. And in this second, well, we're going to spend a few weeks on this one, uh, but it answers two questions. Who is Jesus and what did he do? So those are the two things that really matter. So today, who is Jesus? Well, we just a few minutes ago just stood up and said, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, God the Father, from the previous paragraph, and our Lord, our, our God. We talked about this, you know, in the intro, the week one, uh, when we confess, when we're making a public confession uh, in, in this sense of the word, it's very much like a, a pledge of allegiance. Right? We, are, we are at the same time rejecting some thoughts, some beliefs, some worldviews from our culture, and we are confirming, we are uh, testifying that this is the actual truth. So when we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, we're saying, no, I reject the idea of the world that says Jesus was only a good man. He was only a great teacher. He was only an, an example of love or, or peace uh, for us. We are proclaiming, I know he is God in the flesh, he is our Lord. He is our Savior. And it's spelled out really clear in John's gospel. John was probably a little bit older when he wrote his gospel. The other three had already kind of given the, the, the who, what, where, when, the dates and the names and the places and, uh, of Jesus' life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection. And so when John writes, people kind of are familiar, they are already familiar with Jesus, I He's actually quite famous, uh, obviously. And so John starts off his gospel with this very uh, amazing uh, statement. In the beginning was the Word. That is the Word of God. That is the Word that became flesh. That is, it's Jesus. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, I highlighted this for you, so it's important, right? Uh, he was in the beginning. Jesus existed before the creation of everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Well, Jesus was there before the in the beginning. And all things were, if you're still not sure, all things were, what? Made through him. I remember last week, we talked about the first article. God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. It's like what defines God. He creates everything out of nothing. That's it. He's the only being, the only entity that has that almighty power to create. And John, right at the beginning of his gospel, is making it crystal clear that applies to Jesus too. Now, I, uh, many years ago, I want to say it was in Chattanooga, um, I had a couple of men knock on my door. I'm not going to... Anyway, they were of another world view, we'll say. Um, very nicely dressed. Um, and uh, they never... I'll just say this, okay? They never asked me, okay, if I was a pastor. They never asked me if I read the Greek New Testament. So I didn't offer. I just listened, all right? So they go into their... And uh, I said, let me see... Let me see your Bible. Can I see your Bible? Because they, ha if you don't know this, beware. They have their own translation of the Bible, not commonly used amongst uh, the churches. And one of the things that they, they change in their translation here in, in verse 1 is they say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Stick the word a in there. And they think, aha, well, he's a God, there's a God. A God doesn't really mean that Jesus is the God. That's how they, they play it. Well, it was an older man, a mentor, I'm assuming, and a young man, a mentee, I'm assuming. And so, it's their Bible. I just read it just as it was written. But then I went to the next few verses. He was in the beginning with God. And that seems to elude, right, as we're talking about the definition of God as being the creator. But then in, here's the, this is the one you can't get around. All things were made through him. And there's nothing that exists that he didn't create. And I said, now John was a Jew. He knew how controversial this statement would be to put Jesus, who everybody knew was a man, they heard him, they saw him, on the same level as God. This is, are you kidding me? That's blasphemy if it's not true. And so as I was kind of, I'll go back to my story. So I'm, I'm kind of leading them, kind of leading them through this, leaving little breadcrumbs, right? And the young guy, he's going, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, he was in the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, he created, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I said, so that means Jesus is God. What? Uh, I didn't want to take that next step. Anyway, they, they stood out in my driveway for about an hour debriefing. Um, but <laughs> after our visit, but that's fine. Uh, po point's the same. Uh, John very clearly saying, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. In the very same chapter, down in verse 14, and the word became flesh. Flesh and bone, flesh and blood, and dwelt among us. Jesus, very clearly, John is proclaiming, Jesus is truly, holy, completely God. And Jesus is holy, complete, he is truly human. And this is something that our brains struggle to comprehend. Well, that shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, anything about God who creates everything out of nothing is going to be uh, beyond what we can comprehend. But he reveals to us uh, enough uh, for us to, to hear the truth and to believe the truth in his word. So, uh, moving on, uh, in the small catechism that Martin Luther 
wrote, he uh, kind of expounds upon this phrase, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who is Jesus. Uh, he would say, I believe that Jesus Christ is true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, and that this person is my Lord. It's, that's, the, that's who we confess. Who is Jesus? He is God, and he is man. He is our Lord, and he is our Savior. Now, when we say he's God and he's man at the same time, we say he's truly God and he's truly man. We're saying he's 100% God, and he is 100% man. Well, that doesn't, I don't know. My ledger book at home, I can't make that add up. Great, right? Mysteries of God. There's so many things that we cannot fathom uh, about God. We accept his word as truth, and that's good enough for us. But you may say, well, this is kind of confusing, so why would God even bother us with this information? Because there's, I guarantee you, there's a ton of other things. You want to look at black holes, or you want to look at the endoplasmic reticulum that moves materials within cells. Uh, look, there are so many things that are baffling. You know, why would God tell us this, and why would God make this, uh, right, right here in the first chapter of John, make this so key, so prominent, so important? Why is it important that Jesus was truly a man, 100% human. Well, he had to be, if he's going to be our savior, he had to be able to be our substitute for living under God's law and for fulfilling God's law perfectly. He had to be human so he could come down to the earth, dwell with us, live under the law, and fulfill it. But he also had to be human so that he could suffer for our Guilt, right? Uh, God, again, almost by definition, right? God can't die, but yet Jesus died for you. Another one of the amazing miracles, mind-blowing concepts of our faith that just should just make us wake up every morning in awe of what God not only has created for us, but what God has done to save us, miraculously. So you had to be uh, a human, 100% human, uh, to be able to live under the law and, of course, to suffer the penalty for our sin. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sin. And the wages of sin is death. Right? The result, the just deserts, if you will, for our sinfulness is, is death. So Jesus comes to save us in order to save us. Right? He, he lives the perfect life under God's law, and then he takes upon himself all of our sin, all of it, all of it for everybody. Everybody who's ever lived, everybody who's living today, everybody who ever will live. It was on him, on the cross, of the wrath of God, the punishment for sin was taken out. And then, once he takes our sin away from us, check, this is the, man, this is the best part. We talk about Jesus died for your sins, Jesus died for your sins, he died for, yes, he did, and that's key, it's awesome, it's important. But check this out, he died for our sins, and then he gave us the credit for his perfect life. In other words, he lived a, a life under God's law and he made straight A's. And he gives us his transcript, okay? When we go to apply for a job in heaven, when we go, right, God doesn't see what we've done. He only sees what Jesus did on our behalf, which is perfection. That's incredible. Again, something if we really get it, man, we'll wake up in the morning when our feet hit the floor and we'll say, praise God, Thank you for taking me in to your family, forgiving me, giving me a new life in Jesus Christ. So, he had to be true man. That's why this is important, even though it may be confusing to us. Uh, we know it's true, and we know that's important. But it's also important that he was 100% God. He's totally and completely God. Number one, so that 
his sacrifice would be sufficient for us. Uh, was it Psalm 49, 7? It says, no man or no, no person can ransom the life of another person. In other words, it doesn't matter how much I love you. And I do, I love you. If I haven't said that lately, I love you. I love you very much. Uh, love you, part of our, our church family here in our community. No, but no matter how much I love you and I want you to go to heaven, me sacrificing myself is not going to do anything for you. I, I could say, I love all you folks so much. I really want to take away your sins. I am going to go walk across Scottsdale Road with a blindfold on. <laughs> what does that accomplish for you? Nothing. My life is, this, I'm a sinful person. I can't ransom your life with mine, your soul for my soul. It doesn't work. But God, who is holy, 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 and he lays down his life for you, that is all sufficient right, for all of humanity to take away our sins, to pay the price. And the other reason, this is a pretty important one, Jesus must have been God or he would have been defeated by death. Only the author of life has power over death. This is the great witness that we have that Jesus is God. God, and that Jesus is our Savior, and that his sacrifice was sufficient, and it was acceptable to God on our behalf. I have 1 Corinthians, we have the victory over death through Christ Jesus, and what, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a great gift. I know this is kind of luxury, I know we're talking about the creed and all that, but not just, uh, not just thinking about who Jesus is, he's God and he's man, Let's address the really uncomfortable aspect of the question, who Jesus is. Maybe the more controversial answer. When Jesus says that he is the only way. But Jesus says he's the only way to, to heaven, the only way to God, the only way to get out of this world alive. <laughs> Because obviously, uh, just as many different opinions are out there about Jesus, uh, there's just as many uh, thoughts and perspectives that, that would say that this kind of a statement is it's not very nice. It sounds very exclusive. It does. Don't argue with that. It sounds very, you know, constricting. Why is it more open? Why is it more loving? Well, the popular worldview is that we're all basically good people and we're all out there just trying to do our best to, to get ahead uh, in life, but to, to, get ahead with, to get ahead with God, basically. And so you stand up for the national anthem and you, uh, you let somebody cut and pull out in front of you at a stop sign and you take your wife shopping and you help an old lady across the street you buy Girl Scout cookies, you, you, know, you, you do all these little things, nicety things, and you try to improve yourself, read your self-help books, and you try to become a better person, and, uh, you try to be nicer to other people, and you're kind, of, you're kind of climbing these stairs as if there was this stairway to heaven. I was thinking about writing a song titled that. <laughs> I think it might be a hit. I'm, gonna work, I'm working on it, though. Uh, but as if there was, this, there was this progress that we can make uh, this, this movement that we can achieve uh, step by step, closer and closer to God, closer and closer to heaven, to, our, to the ultimate goal. And it seems like it would work. It seems intuitive because that's exactly what we see in the world. When it comes to our relationship with other people, that's, that's absolutely how it works, right? We are very actively involved in whether or not we have a good relationship with a neighbor or a bad relationship with a family member. If, uh, uh, actually this summer, our, my neighbor went on vacation for a week. He's like, hey, Mark, uh, we're gonna be gone. We're gonna see family. Hey, could you 
just look for any Amazon packages on the front porch. You just put them in your garage until we get back. Dude, absolutely. Be happy to do that for you. Oh, thanks so much. Well, in a couple weeks, when I go out of town, and I say, I go to him, hey, could you, whatever, pick up the paper, look for Amazon. What do you think he's going to say? Yeah, sure, of course. You do it for me, I'll do it for you. You've been a good neighbor to me, I'll be a good neighbor to you. Works that way in our jobs, right? You, you stay late to get the project done on time. Uh, you go over and above to help out somebody in another department to get their work done, right? You, you move up. School. Uh, we got a lot of kids in kids' time, but we got a few younger ones here. You're probably already starting to learn this in school, right? You, if you study hard uh, for your test, if you always do your homework, if you don't skip class, you're always in class, you're probably going to make better grades, right? The, if you did the opposite of those things. So we, we get it, right? This is how it works. But when it comes to the big stuff, right, when it comes to our relationship with God, it just doesn't work that way. It can't work that way because God is holy, holy, holy. And we are all born sinful and unclean. And we can't be in the presence of a holy God without getting like, evaporated or something uh, in his holy presence in our sinful condition. So it's something that we cannot achieve on our own, and that is why God comes down to be with us. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one, how many people, a few people, a handful, a million, no, nobody, no how comes to the Father except through me. Jesus comes along and he blows up the staircase this whole concept that the religious leaders had, the Pharisees had all these 100, 600 something laws you follow, you can get holy. Other religions, they're all the same. All the other religions uh, have this concept, whether it's five pillars in the slum, they do these five things, and maybe, maybe, maybe you'll make it. Even Eastern religions, uh, if you want to, uh, it's all about improving yourself or emptying yourself or becoming one with the universe. You're meditating, you're doing. No, no, no. It does not work that way. It can't work that way, even if you just think about it for a second. But the, the, uh, the point that I really want to make, because I, I agree, when Jesus says, I am the way, and no one comes about except through me, it does sound very exclusive. It sounds, I mean, that's not how we think in our culture today. That's, that's kind of rude. But you got to Look at the big picture here. The question is, what do we really deserve? Because we're coming at this with this assumption that, well, we all deserve to go to heaven, so it's just not fair that you wouldn't let this or that or this, you could do it this way or that way or climb the ladder yourself. What do we really deserve? The wages of sin is, is death. What do we really deserve when we, each and every one of us, have polluted harmed, taken advantage, abused his creation, his wonderful, wonderful world. What do we deserve when we harm a brother or a sister, one of his children, when we speak ill of them, when we offend them, when we sin against them, what do we deserve? No way to the Father. No way to heaven. No way. That's what we deserve. So the fact that there's a way. Hey, there's a way? This is awesome! Because I didn't think there was any way I could ever get up that staircase. Yeah, you're right. You couldn't get it. Guess what? God comes to you. Literally. Physically in the flesh, to dwell with us. And he continues to come to us and dwell with us in his word, in his sacraments, through the power of his Holy Spirit. He lives within us, reminding us of his love and his forgiveness, the promises, reminding us of his word and how we are to live as witnesses out in the world. It was just as offensive uh, then as it is today, right? When Jesus, a couple thousand years ago, said, before Abraham was, I am. That's like the sacred name, like Yahweh, 
He's saying, I am God. And they knew exactly what he was saying. And so what did they do? They picked up stones to throw at him. It's just as, again, offensive uh, today. Uh, In the book Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, talks about, uh, to answer the question, who is Jesus? There's only three possibilities. He's either, Jesus, he's either a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Uh, C.S. Lewis gets a lot of credit for this. He, I've dug a little deeper. It turns out John Duncan, uh, maybe 100 years before, uh, used a different alliteration. Instead of L's, he used D's. Uh, he said, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, liar. He was deluded or self-deceived himself, lunatic. Or he was divine. He was the Lord, as he claimed to be. You, you use your favorite uh, alliteration. But here's the point. Remember the video at the beginning? All these different people in, in, uh, in uh, Central Park. All these different ideas about Jesus. He was a good teacher. He was uh, morally, you know, ahead of his time. He was inspirational. Uh, he was a prophet, you know. Maybe he was you know, a holy man. The scriptures don't let us just stop there. It, it's just not possible when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. When he says, before Abraham was, I am. When John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word's with God, and everything was made through him. It's very clear what Jesus' claims are. It just doesn't give us that easy out of saying, yeah, he's a good guy, yeah, listen to him. No, he was very clearly either a liar, a lunatic, or he was the Lord. If he's a liar, then I would ask, to what advantage? What, what benefit did he get by lying to people about being God? Well, I don't know, first two, three years, I guess he started grabbing some crowds. He was popular, you know, Sermon on the Mount. He fed, fed 5,000 people were coming out to hear him, a very popular person. But I got to think, right, when I'm arrested in the middle of the night, and I'm drugged in before uh, the Jewish and the Roman uh, authorities and put on trial, like, like right away, I'm like, uh, I was, no, I, I'm sorry, you misunderstood what I said. I, <laughs> that's not what I was saying. Uh, just let me go. But and that's where I would give in. But <laughs> let's say he's really stubborn. And maybe when the soldiers blindfolded him and punched him in the face and spit on him, maybe then he would say, it's time to stop the lie and come clean. But if not that, I would think certainly. And they drug him out into the, the courtyard, like an arena, and they, and they bound him to the, the pillar, and, and they, they took the cat of nine tails, these leather straps with pieces of bone and steel, and beat his back again and again and again, ripping the skin. You could see the bone. You could see the ribs in his back. If he's lying, guys, really, it's a big misunderstanding. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say what it sounded like. Just a rabbi, just a traveling evangelist. Or at the very least, when they lay him down upon the cross, they drive spikes through his hands and his feet and hang him up for hours to die of asphyxiation, shock. To what advantage would he be a liar? No, that one doesn't work for me. What about a lunatic? He's just deluded. Some of the most profound teachings... Some of the most insightful were insightful into man, humanity, and relationship. Some of the wisest words that are remembered through multiple religions uh, all around the world still thousands of years later. The person who came up 
and invented the golden rule that everybody knows and, and aspires to. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He was a lunatic? I, I can't get, no. I, I think he had a sound mind. There's only one option the scriptures leaves us, and that is that he is the Lord. He is divine. And ultimately, how do we know that Jesus is God? One of my professors said it a little more colloquially. I, I kind of like it. We know Jesus is God because he did God stuff. <laughs> he did God stuff. He controlled the weather. <laughs> he healed people. He wrote, brought people back to life that were dead. He came back to life after he was dead. He is divine. He is the Lord. And thus, he is sufficient to be our Savior from sin and our pathway, <laughs> our stairway, if you, if you must have it, uh, to heaven, to our Maker, to our God. Now, we confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. Let us believe in our hearts and let that belief lead to action. So, man, if maybe you're here, maybe you're online, maybe this is the first time you've really ever dug this deep into this question before. You've never given it much thought, paid much attention to it. I would just beg you uh, today to consider Jesus. Uh, maybe you grew up in church, you've got some church background, but you've kind of uh, wandered off, not really an important part of your life anymore. Wow. Just consider Jesus now. How important this, the answer to this question is to you and your life. Hey, maybe you're here every week, you're, you're fully committed, uh, you're, you praise God that he sent his son to rise from the dead so you'll have eternal life too. Consider Jesus even more. <laughs> uh, spend more time with him in prayer, more time in his word, listen to him speak into your life. He is the Lord. He is our Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for sending your Son into the flesh to be our Lord and our Savior. He is uh, the revelation of